teacher, I'll talk all maybe 30 to 40 minutes. If you have questions as I go along or comments, maybe say, do you really know what you're talking about? <laughs> Don't hesitate to speak up. Uh, I'm going to be light on geology, a lot of stuff just about sapphires, starting off with a brief, brief introduction and then going into describing the different deposits, the major deposits in Montana. And to start with, we kind of think of sapphire as being blue. Some are, they certainly command a high price, but they really come in all colors, from colorless to yellow to pale green and pale blue and blue. Sapphire is the gem variety of the mineral. Let me get over here. Uh, corundum, which is aluminum oxide. Yeah, I understand. Thank you. <laughs> we can't uh, see you now. Fairly <laughs> common mineral in metamorphic rocks. This is from the Bolton area. The plain old corundum is not gemmy. It's just this gray stuff. That's about two inches long. know what you're talking about. <laughs> okay, here are the deposits, the major deposits in Montana. Uh, Rock Creek and around Butte, Missouri oh. River, and the Yoga River. I'll start at Rock Creek, which is the big guy, really the big guy. You're perfect. This is kind of interesting. This is historic production. Montana's produced more sapphires by far than any other state. And the big guy is Rock Creek. I show these in metric tons because it's such an easy conversion. Five million carats is one metric ton. But look at the production from Rock Creek. 65 metric tons. To give you an idea of what that's like, if you had a box, heavy wood box, 10 feet by 10 feet, had sides up quite a ways, you could fill it with these sapphires of about eight feet. It's loosely packed. Now, most of these are not gem quality. Maybe about 10% of sapphires have been mined are gem quality. Most are not. <clears throat> but the total production from Montana is something like maybe 80 tons. Sounds strange to talk about gemstones in terms of tons. Finally, they talk about carrots. A carrot is two tenths of a gram. A gram is about the weight of a two inch paper clip. So one carrot sapphire is not very big. This is the Rock Creek District that's west of Phillipsburg. And I'll bet some of you have been to Gem Mountain where you can have a lot of fun sipping gravel. It's a concentrate. You're sure to find these sapphires. And it's really neat when you do it right. You flop the sieve and you see these pretty little stones sitting right on the top of it in the bright sunlight. How many of you have been there? Good place to go. The distance across here, Anaconda Gulch to Sapphire Gulch is about a mile. And the amazing thing here, that total production from Rock Creek is from about four square miles. A tremendous concentration of sapphires. Now there's a company doing bulk mining up in this area and they had a very successful summer, it's potentate mining, in mining a lot of sapphires. The red here are gulches that were mined in historic time. I have to go back to my notes for these dates. Uh, Rock Creek was found in 1892. Most of the mining was between 1900 and in the 30s. During, must have been 1911, 
they're producing a thousand sapphires a week. Interesting thing here are the blue lines. These are ditches. As probably you know, in the old days of plaster mining, they didn't use pumps. Water was so critical. One of those ditches goes 16 miles, kitchen and flume, to Stony Lake. When the water was flowing, they mined 24 hours a day. There's some correspondence in the state library's records, thanks to the Antonoles, that is a letter from a company asking for a quote on two tons of carbide, for carbide lights. And they had when I read big lights for reflectors, maybe that big across for their night mining, when the water was running, and then they do the cleanup during the day. The orange here are belts that have been mined more recently. And this shows some of the fairly early mining where they ground sluice. They had a ditch up there, they had a little ditch that came in and just washed the water down into the sluice box, and also a hydraulic nozzle there. So the water would be under high pressure, they could again wash the gravel down, and uh, Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Come on in. Uh, pick the larger boulders out of their sluice box, fork, or they put them in the bucket, and then during the day, they pick out the sapphire. Big time operation there. <laughs> that was the market, watch bearings. And look at how small some of these are, only about a millimeter. The market was mainly in Switzerland. They shipped most of them there. And there's a letter, I think, of 1914 from the buyer there saying something of that you guys better send better goods because they're now making scientific ruby he called it we call it synthetic sapphire and that was handwriting on the wall in the 30s uh, synthetic sapphire replaced the natural stones and that was the end of the heyday of mining there for many years. Incidentally, they say that some of the larger stones had to be broken so it could be machined into these small bearings. Be interesting to see how they did that, how they machined them. Kind of light here, but this is a photo of some of the Rock Creek sapphires. The uh, largest one there might be seven millimeters across, and they're the typical pale green of most Montana sapphires. I'm just going to get this stool and be lazy for a few minutes. There's some pinks here, and really more pinks than you'd normally find. Uh, when I pick these photographs, I must have picked out, for some reason, quite a few pinks. This is interesting. The blue sapphires here have been made blue by heat treating natural sapphires. And actually, this is done worldwide at something like 90% of the sapphire. A heat treated sapphire is every bit as stable as a natural blue. Uh, something like 65% of the sapphires from Rock Creek are amenable to heat treating. Sapphire melts at about 2,000 degrees C, and they're heated from 14 to 1,700 degrees C. What that does, it enables the titanium plus four the iron plus two kind of get together, uh, transfer outer electrons, and that's what makes the blue color. With the introduction of heat treating in the early 80s, there is again a market for the Rock Creek sapphires, as well as others from Montana. 
Any questions so far? Yes. How are sapphires formed as far as how is the rock generated? <clears throat> oh, you'll have to wait until I do my geologic speculation. <laughs> okay. I try to separate that from the fact. I hope what I'm telling you now is fact. Okay. <laughs> and this uh, are some people at Gem Mountain having fun picking out sapphires. So what did you pick out is tiny, tiny? Well, most of them are, although some are larger. And I haven't been there for a long time doing that, but I think when you buy a bucket, bucket is 25 bucks, and it's a concentrate, uh, you're apt to get one or two that are big enough to cut. Uh, be, Excuse me. Maybe two carrots in the rough, something like that. Normally, you figure that in sapphires, the cut weight would be about a third of the rough weight, something like that. But they cut some very small ones overseas. Okay, going on to South Fork of Dry Cottonwood and the Butte area. South Fork of Dry Cottonwood drains into uh, Clark Fork by Deer Lodge. And they didn't produce a lot of sapphires, but I show this photo because I think it's such a cool one. This is typical of the pale colors of most Montana sapphires. It can be tricky to distinguish between sapphires and quartz. I've been fooled. But the difference is, I think you can see it in some of these, they're kind of frosty. If you're panning stuff and have grains that are really shiny and glassy, the odds are they're quartz. Certainly not diamonds. <laughs> quartz. The sapphires tend to be pale colors. But if you have a very small sapphire, let's say it's a millimeter or less, sometimes it's hard to see that pale color. But it's really in bright light, if you're familiar with sapphires, I say it's easy, even though I've been fooled by it. So, and I've looked at a lot of sapphires. I think this is really a neat photo. It's hard to find good historic photos. This was taken in 1910 of a small bridge, a bucket line bridge, and you can see where the uh, tailings are coming out of the pond on this side. Bucket line is on the far side. Of the, uh, they have a chain with these buckets that go down and dig up the gravel. And those buckets were only about one cubic foot. Very small bridge. I think that's probably the smallest bucket line bridge in Montana. There, they were covering gold and sapphires. Rock Creek, very little gold. But they just didn't make mu enough money on it. This is before he treated Denver. And so only a after only a few years, they quit. There's been more recent mining there uh, on dry cotton, South Fork dry cotton. There are also sapphires found right around Butte here. Mike Stickney, and I think he gave a talk here a while ago, our seismologist, found a nice one when he was uh, washing gravel for gold on Whiskey Gulch. It's about six carats. Uh, within probably two miles of here, I panned sapphires from Gimlet Gulch, just small guys. I think they weather out of the volcanics around here, and I think, I don't know, was it last spring they heard about Lowell and Creek volcanics from New Caleb? Yeah. Something like that. And these are 50 million years old, and I think from, well, research I've done, it looks like those are the source of the sapphires, as well as for Rock Creek, where they're also volcanics, lava flows and stuff, about 50 million years old. On to Missouri River, which is totally different from Rock Creek. Less production. Sapphires are spread all along the river in these bars, as they're called. They're terraces, technically strath terraces. 
where when there's a high flow of water, probably during the last ice age, when glaciers, during what they call interglacial times, glaciers melted, a lot of water came down, cut these terraces in hard bedrock, deposited gravel that contained sapphires. The source of the sapphires were the Missouri River deposits, I don't know about. And they're what I've been working on now. And I have guesses, but nothing definite. It's a challenge. That's what makes it fun. If we're easy, I don't know, everyone would do it, you just walk out and find this stuff. It doesn't work that way. I make a lot of mistakes. For Missouri River, I'm on hypothesis 25. <laughs> <laughs> But French Bar down here was mined in the 1860s, big time for gold. And it's interesting, it's called French Bar because there were French people mining there, which to me is kind of unusual for Montana. The water for French Bar mining gold came from Beaver Creek out of Winston, 25 miles of ditches and flues. I think there's an interesting project for someone to study the ditches and flumes in Montana and write a book on it. They're fascinating. But they didn't recover the sapphires. They just washed them into the then Missouri River. The big deposit is El Dorado Bar, and that's where people are mining now. And that was discovered in 1862 all of the sapphire deposits in Mount Anything were discovered by gold plaster miners. At that time, people weren't really looking for sapphires. And so a lot of the production from this area was for gold in the early days. This is uh, a trench cut at French Bar where they really put a sluice box, washed the gravel down there, and again, picked out the bigger chunks, put them on one side, washed the small stuff in the Missouri River. More recently, in September 1973, Matt Mater, who has a bridge, or had a bridge, in Hauser Lake, recovered a beautiful 22 carat blue sapphire that was cut to 12 carats. Surprising large weight of the cut stone called the Big Sky Sapphire. And that was naturally blue. There are a few blue sapphires from Missouri River more than from Rocky. And the sapphires there tend to be larger. This is Blaze Wharton, who mines an El Dorado bar, and what's between his hand and his feet, the bedrock, is the pay gravel. I think a lot of times, like gold, it's the lower uh, beds of gravel that are richest. And some people there will go and really dig in the, the bedrock, just the upper little bit where it's all kind of fractured, and recover sapphires. And one guy with dug with a screwdriver. Is that's just like gold. That's where they get trapped. This is Bruce Scharf, who also mines in El Dorado Bar. And this is his washing setup. Something like gold, the gravel is first size, so only the finer stuff comes down that chute into the riffle here. You see the bars across. But unlike gold, uh, jigs are used. Maybe some of you know how a jig works. It's pretty cool. Uh, jig, oh, maybe two and a half feet by two and a half feet. And there's a diaphragm below it where it, it pulsates. The water comes in, goes up, and the front of it has a sapphire density about four quarts, two, six, five, two, five, six, five. So 
when water comes in, moves stuff up, what happens? Quartz goes up higher. Sapphires don't go up as fast. And then when you do this for a while, with this gravel being fed in here, uh, usually the first couple of ripples are where you find sapphire. And also any iron minerals, any other heavy stuff. A lot of garnets occur with these sapphires, especially along the Missouri River. This is a beauty that Bruce recovered in 2012. Uh, and that was cut to seven carats. And it looks like it's a darker green than most of them. But this is just common sense. I'm sure you realize this. When you have a bigger stone, it's going to look darker than a very small guy. And this was heat treated. I haven't seen it since it was cut and heat treated, but came out a very nice blue. So that was a real fine for Bruce. And you know, as you know, when you're mining this stuff, finding one of those pays for processing a lot of gravel. It's like so many things, diamonds or whatever, price goes up exponentially depending on the size. Okay, on to the famous guy. Yoko. Before I do that, are there any more questions? Well, maybe I'm actually making sense. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> it's interesting. In the gem trade, and I'm not you know, a gemologist, I really shuddered. It was in the paper. It said sapphire expert. I'm not a sapphire expert. I'm just plain old geologist. When you think of a sapphire expert, you think of a gemologist, but I'm not. Anyway, Yogo sapphires are known in the trade as Yogo sapphires. All the other sapphires are called Montana sapphires, and most of these are heat treated. These are some beautiful Yogo sapphires. Uh, the largest one there is about 11 millimeters across. They're typically a pretty blue, and some are purple. They tend to be very clean. And because of the neat colors, they don't have to be heat treated. This is one in the dike rock. Now, these were found, again by a gold miner, in the gravel there. Jake Hoover, according to the reports. And he was smart enough to realize maybe these little blue stones are worth something. So he filled a cigar box with them took them into his assay, who sent them to Tiffany and Company in New York, and they sent Jake a check to $3,750. And in today's dollars, they'd be worth a little over $100,000. But if there were sapphires in there that were big enough to cut, say for cut a little over a carat, that box would a lot more. But what this shows, again, this is a dike that's about 50 million years old, is the nice blue color, but how the sapphire is tabular. Two things, problem for yoga sapphires. One, they tend to be small, and they tend to be flat. You want a brilliant cut sapphire, it's hard to get a brilliant cut out of a flat piece of sapphire. This is where they dug out along the dike in the early days of mining, uh, when an English firm did this. And they mined for a number of years. Apparently were successful. I have to say this, I think in the whole sapphire business that I've seen, quite a few years, a lot of other stuff. It's kind of like a lot of the gold stuff. A lot of people get sapphire fever, they think they'll make money on the sapphire mine, but it's all in the marketing. It's all in costs and what you're doing when you're competing in a world market. This is a neat photo of what I think is where they put the rock they mine, these are underground mines then, solid bedrock, out to weather. So they could recover the sapphires, 
without destroying them by crushing the rock. This is a mine that's been operation recently, underground mine. Some people, local people, discovered an extension of one of the dike there, contained sapphires, and called Vortex. Now it's here, Rock Yogo Creek Mining. It's been through a number of hands. And this is taken underground. Shows the dike in the back. See that just crack there, kind of? The dike varies in thickness from a few inches to 12 feet. But at that time, the way they mined this, it's kind of interesting, is a high pressure water jet, 40,000 psi. And they washed the kind of alder dike rock down, washed it down to the sill, and mucked it up. More recently, the mining was conventional mining. No mining goes on there now, a uh, little bit, but 2012, Mike Roberts, who was just a super guy, unfortunately was killed. And so there's not really been much mining since then. So if you have Yogo sapphires, probably it's a good time to just hold on to them. Yogo sapphires are quite valuable. Uh, stone of about one carat, cut polished, is five to nine thousand dollars. But then like diamonds or anything, the price goes up exponentially. Uh, one and a half carat, twenty thousand. Uh, one and a half carat might be about the size, I think a little smaller than the eraser on an ordinary lead pencil. Uh, Montana heat treated sapphire, which is what I bought for my wife's uh, sapphire anniversary, uh, maybe 800 to 1,000 for a carat, depending on the color. Are yogos more rare? Is that why they're more expensive? Yeah, I think also in gemstones. Again, I'm not a gemologist, but people pay a lot for a specific locality. They're famous. But it's also that beautiful blue color. It's like rubies from Myanmar, probably Burma. Uh, area well known for rubies, they command a high price, even though they're mined other places. Okay, this is kind of interesting. Uh, we put together a compilation, I say we because I had so much help with it, of reported sapphire occurrences in the state. A lot of them. Well, the ones that are read are verified. There's some that I say are probable, some are possible, some are unlikely. And in the early days of newspapers, oh, they had these glowing accounts. There is one of <coughs> precious stone field out of Denton. It's in the pheasant country northeast of Lewistown. Oh, diamond deposit going to rival South Africa, sapphires and rubies. I've not been there, but I'm very skeptical. I know it's not a big guy. Mm -hmm. So you probably read some of the old newspapers. They really like to talk up these things. Anyway, you asked about how these sapphires form. From my research, this is my present model, they were produced in metamorphic rocks at depth in the lower crust. Rocks that were fairly aluminous in chemical composition, so they formed chromium, AL203. These then, these chunks were brought up, and sapphire being more refractory, not at a high temperature than a lot of other stuff, the sapphires were liberated, and I've done quite a bit of work on a sill on Missouri River, where there's sapphires in it. It's not a major source at all, but there are chunks of rock called xenoliths that contain corundum. That's my idea. It's an exciting time to be involved in sapphire research. Uh, I have a friend who's down in Queensland who is uh, 
has a different model for them. Uh, he has an article that's submitted for publication on that. There's another article published about a year ago, Gem Gemology, where they have a whole different idea. I guess what that shows is we really don't know. But the area to the right here are old metamorphic rocks, two to three billion years old. The rocks to the northwest, about 1.8 billion years old. And the old rocks are what's called a craton, old stuff there, obviously old. And then well, probably where marine sediments slid into it, thanks to plate tectonics. My hypothesis is that these had a composition when metamorphosed would produce sapphire. This would explain why we don't have those in the neighboring states. But it's not totally foolproof. I don't have the whole equation yet. I don't know if I ever will. So does that answer your question about how they form? Yeah, thank you. Do you sort of believe that? I don't know if you should. <laughs> That's one guy's opinion. And many people would share that with me, but others would disagree who are every bit as capable. Oh, this is cool. Just about the end. This looks like it could be the surface of a planet. I could talk all afternoon and show you scanning electron micrographs of the surface of the sapphire. They're fascinating. And just a little digression, if you gave me 10 from Rock Creek, 10 from Butte Deer Lodge area, 10 from Missouri River, on the basis of the surface characteristics, I or anyone who's looked at a lot could differentiate between them. Not one, but probably actually just five, because they're different. This feature, I think, these features are a result of resorption, solution in the magma. When these guys were brought up in the molten rock, it would be like putting a, a salt crystal in a creek. It would slowly dissolve, it'd get etched, funny stuff would happen to it. I and most people who worked on these agree that these features are results of resorption the scale here goes kind of off the screen, 600 microns. Give you an idea, the diameter of a piece of my hair is 60 microns. But these are absolutely fascinating. Any of you looked at some of the reports we've done on sapphires, they did just gobs of them. Uh, in a poster I did years ago, where I showed a lot of these, the only smart thing I said at the bottom, I said, it's easier to observe than to explain. <laughs> very true. Uh, now I'm up to my last slide with my conclusions. Sit up with a grin on my face. <laughs> That's a Thank you. <laughs>